Um, my name is David Target. I am a graduate assistant for the Office of Gift Planning this semester, um, and I'm here with Mr. Kerr. So, Mr. Kerr, thank you for meeting with us today. Um, I was wondering if no you problem. could give us a quick synopsis of your career prior to becoming a professor at St. John's University. Well, uh, I took my undergraduate at the Alberta College of Art and Design in Canada. Um, when I completed that, I was became interested in a program that I had learned about in New York. Uh, it was a new new program at that time. Uh, now it's it's edging up on its thirtieth year, mm -hmm. but it, it was um, illustration is visual journalism as at the time, and that was of you know great interest to me. Some of the people who were teaching it were political illustrators. I had always been interested in that. Um, my my father was an immigrant from uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, I've had relatives who were uh, basically subjugated by the English government, uh, both in what we would now call uh, they called it concentration camps, but they would they would basically hold them indefinitely mm -hmm. uh, because mainly just because they may have been associated with uh, somebody who was Irish Catholic, and they would when they were in jail they would send home these kerchiefs that were you know emblazoned with like political slogans and uh, speaking specifically to the oppression that they were experiencing in northern ireland as catholics at that time so it probably had a deep effect on me so i always felt that art had a uh, potential um to change opinion or to show opinion you know show up the facts of, of what was going on in the world mm -hmm. and that you could influence people that way so I became very interested in that, and, and I thought that considering uh, some of the instructors at this graduate program were uh, political illustrators, that I would learn much from them. And I would have access to probably the greatest media market in, in the world, which is New York City. Right. Uh, from there, um, I, I was a little naive. I, I, the city I came from is not a small town, but it, it's not New York. No, not many places are. So I just took my portfolio and walked into the New York Times, um, and the fellow there uh, thought I would did good drawings. I felt that they measured up to what they were currently using at that time. So uh, he said he'd give me a call, which at the time I thought he was blowing me off, but <laughs> but it, it turns out he really was going to give me a call, and he did. And I became a staple at the New York Times. I was doing probably three to five drawings a week. Okay. And I've, I've done probably close to 400 for the New York Times itself. Wow. Um, what I did, what I didn't realize at that time was that um, other news outlets and media outlets that use political freelance work kind of refer to the Times as a gold standard for that. And so before too long, I was doing work for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Chicago Tribune. The LA Times, uh, Newsweek, uh, Newsday, Der Spiegel. Um, as soon as the market opened up because of computers, because it used to have to be local, right. but when the computers opened it up, you were no longer had to be local. So um, as it turns out, I was producing about 600 drawings a year. Awesome. And that's, what, and that's what, how I made my living for probably about 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, often, uh, in terms of academics, though I held a graduate degree, um, I really wasn't. I did teach a little bit, sort of as an adjunct, mm -hmm. uh, teaching really basic stuff like figure drawing and pen and ink and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a full time thing for me. I, I was asked because they knew of my work as a political illustrator. And then I gave a lecture in Boston, at, and the chair of the illustration department directly afterwards said you have to apply here as a full-time professor and uh i talked over with my family um you know probably more so with my wife than with my my daughter at the time but we made the decision to take up that position and it was only contractual so at the end of that first uh that first year or first not first year first uh contractual agreement mm -hmm. i put my shingle out 
and uh, ended up with a few offers in hand, one of which was St. John's University. Uh, I'm not afraid of New York because I'd lived here for you know the 12 years prior. So we made the trip back. Um, we accepted the the offer, and uh, I've been illustrating uh, as well, but teaching here full time since uh, 2000. Awesome. And uh, in the mean, in meanwhile, I've still been illustrating. As a matter of fact, today, as as we speak. I'm working on an illustration uh, for The Wave, which is New York's oldest um, weekly newspaper. Actually, it's maybe the, may the oldest paper now, period. And it publishes locally in, in Queens. And I do a weekly piece for them. And I do whatever freelance comes in right. as it comes in. So basically, that's my career in a nutshell. Over the... Uh, you know, over the span of all this, I've actually been teaching for 34 years. Okay. Um, you know, and uh, I guess you could say the last 20 have been with St. John's. Awesome. So this has definitely been a unique uh, past couple of months with the outbreak of coronavirus. So I was wondering what challenges uh, coronavirus has brought upon you in teaching drawing and illustration at uh, St. John's. Has the the virtual teaching and learning environment made your job harder or have you been able to uncover some unique teaching opportunities that have benefited your students to this virtual environment? Um, that's a good question. It's actually a very good question. It, it mainly because I'm not sure I'm, it's, it's easy to do in every aspect of visual arts. Yeah. Uh, in in advising people, like I, I still teach a lot of drawing courses, and in order to sort of monitor how somebody is, is managing in it, you can look at it two ways. If it is process, in other words, the activity of doing something mm -hmm. versus product, which is the actual end object, uh, it's hard to gauge the process that people undergo. Right to make something. So when you're drawing, there's many ways you could draw. You could lay out a grid and, and create a rendering. And I don't think in that instance, you would need somebody to oversee what it was you're doing. But if uh, you're on the other hand, uh, trying to get somebody to make observational drawings and do it efficiently and, and is, um, cause it's a complex undertaking. Uh, to get them to do that, then uh, you have to kind of watch them, guide them as they go, right. <laughs> which means you have to be in orbit. So even now, uh, you know, I'm teaching figure drawing and anatomy right now, and, and there's the issue of having models. Mm -hmm. There is the issue of um, being socially distanced when you have to sort of go in orbit behind the students. And also there's space issues. Um, I think St. John's has done commendably. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll just go right out. They've done very well. Uh, they've provided enough space for social distancing. They have provided um, a lot of lead time. It's more work. But I, I see the students progressing, and they're getting the material down, and that's that's terrific. Um, for non-majors, who I occasionally teach, right. um, I, I think the hybrid environment is actually very good uh, because what you end up doing is giving them in-person instruction, Mm -hmm. And then uh, getting the results in progress or in situ as as you uh, as, as in the second class. So uh, before tomorrow, sometime today, I'll, I'll have to log into Blackboard and go in and grade all the ongoing submissions. Then when it comes into Friday, which is tomorrow's class, we'll discuss on how they could make corrections or improve what they're doing. And then in the end, they'll upload all of their work online and they can even blackboard allows you to grade the threads so they can actually critique the work and you can grade the critique and you set up a, a what's called a rubicon for what they need to discuss and how you discuss artwork you know constructively not you know it's just bad enough if you say i just like it or i hate it that doesn't really qualify anything right. but they'll tell you why it, it seems to be working or, or not working awesome um, so now I just wanted to go back a little bit prior to you um, becoming a professor at St. John's. Um, so on your website, you describe your motivations as being simple. You simply love to draw. Um, so as you continue to visually comment and explore the world through drawn media, um, 
how do you use this as a medium or do you use this as a medium to voice your dislike of political and corporate corruption we are currently seeing? Well, it, it's, it's, a uh, it's a shame really. We often see the, the evening hosts or the weekend satirists and they, they discuss what's obviously wrong. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not anti one particular politician or political party or another because each has its own follies. Right. But when you, you've got an exemplar or something that's standing out as being very unusual, you kind of focus in on that. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of responding to it, I, I kind of, you're kind of a receiver. You're kind of like the you know, when the pitcher is pitching, that's what society is doing and you're the catcher. So you catch it and then you're like, okay, that, that didn't come in too good. And you're, and you headed the empire and you, you say, what do you think about it? Let's draw a picture about this. Right. And that's kind of what's happening. Uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit these days, uh, with, uh, you know, the, the president, uh, he, he's, will say as many awkward and strange things as a political figure can, but he's not alone. He's not alone. Uh, they're all caught up in various degrees of hypocrisy or various degrees of misinformation. Um, uh, what motivates me is, is that a lot of times, and it's getting, I think, a, a little more difficult these days, is to proffer an opinion. Uh, opinion has to be very carefully considered. Uh, it can go sideways really quickly if you offend the wrong people um it, it you might even say it these days that political illustration might be one of the most uh you know difficult of you know points of views because you've got uh you know ongoing things with cancel culture and right. and you know that kind of thing but uh for me i think you just take a look at who's doing right by the people you know i think it's important for everybody to be aware of their environment and who is controlling things and how you can speak back to that. And I think, I think if I were to tell anybody, you know, I, I wouldn't have any regrets of anything I've put out. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to be come from a sort of central neutral place. If, if something was good, I would, and I don't usually cheerlead. That's the other kind of odd thing about political art. I don't cheerlead for anybody. I don't, champion um one point of view or the other right. but if somebody goes out of their way to you know you sort of like a it's like a visual criticism and people usually understand visual criticism better than they understand verbal criticism the, the best example might be boss tweed of tammany hall mm -hmm. um uh, there's a famous story that his uh there was a, a political illustrator at the time, his name was Thomas Nast, and he would do a weekly contribution to the, I believe it's the New York Herald. And in it, he would excoriate Boss Tweed, who was the political leader of New York. And somebody came in to his office and said, Boss Tweed, look what they've, they've written about you. Mm -hmm. And his reply was, I don't care what they wrote, look what they drew. And I think that sort of gets to the crux of the power of, you know, political illustration, just like the drawings of Richard Nixon, just like the drawings of, of Voss Tweed, just, you know, they all kind of follow the same, you know, all the great political villains of history all get their comeuppance at the artist's pen because right. we, we don't have to answer to them. I mean, Franco was drawn by Picasso. Uh, Hitler was um, excoriated visually by Hartfelt. There's an enormous history of that. Right. Uh, it's it's not always a safe place to be, but uh, you know, fortunately, people still feel that they can uh, get that sort of work published, and they can lampoon and satirize, you know, society and these political figures. Right. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Oh, definitely. And art can definitely, it sounds like art is a powerful medium of communication, especially in the world of politics and, and corporate business plans. Well, drawing especially, and, and if I just a, a brief aside, you know, drawing, everybody does it. When you yeah. write, uh, you know, text, you're drawing letters. Those right. letters are symbols. Those symbols translate to sounds. You reinterpret them when you read them into a language. Right. And 
we participated in every level. You're the clothing you, you wear was drawn out by a designer. The uh, movies that you see were all drawn out as storyboards. Right. A almost every aspect, serious aspect of our culture really has at its core drawing. I never looked at it like that. And I think that's really interesting. And maybe our alumni will take a different perspective away on, on the world. And that drawing is a fundamental and illustration is a fundamental component upon which everything is built. Well, it, it, drawing it, I think, more so than the illustration is, um, is sort of like a, a handmaiden of it, just like graphic design would be, which we do have a graphic design department, and just, just like fine arts, uh, which is more personal and uh, more personally motivated. But uh, they all have the same kind of root, even with the writers who draw the letters you know, and you sometimes lose track of how important it really is. Right. That's the more fundamental. Illustrators, the term illustrate comes from a Latin term. It's a illustrare, I think is how it's pronounced. And it means to shed light upon or illuminate. Mm -hmm. And that's what the illustrator's job is to do, uh, to illuminate. And it probably comes from those old illustrated manuscripts that you see of the Bible where you'd have an illustrated letter um, the Book of the Kells would be probably a wonderful example of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it has a, it has its own place, but every part of it is, I think, equally important. When you go out and you are trying to purchase a car, hopefully the person who conceptualized that and drew it made a nice-looking car for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Um, and then kind of staying on this topic, um, do you – it sounds like the the work that you and, and – your fellow colleagues do in terms of de visually depicting what we are seeing in the world today. Um, do you think your guys' work gains enough exposure? Um, because I think it's important for people to see this stuff as a way to, to better understand what is really happening. Well, uh, that's, that's a very good question. I think it is a, and a little underappreciated and it's because Artists tend to toil in separate environments. I think there, I saw this meme um, on uh, social media where they had an artist before COVID and he's in the studio working alone, an artist during COVID in his studio working alone. And there was no difference, right. basically. They, they kind of work alone. Uh, it is a little underappreciated uh, it, because it is you need some sort of flash or notoriety to kind of come up into what we would call the active media, the uh, news and into magazines and things of that nature that would praise it as being very valuable. And right. some, sometimes not everything that pops up into that and gets the notoriety is, is as wonderful as it should be these days. But I think that that's not what motivates people who make images. And, there's, it's a complicated practice. There used to be a belief that, and it's that say you had a beautiful subject, yeah. like you had a, a beautiful bouquet of flowers and you were to paint or draw this bouquet of flowers perfectly. Yeah. They, they would, in fact, um, you'd be capturing that beauty, putting it on a canvas in a still fashion or in a piece of paper, and it would retain that beauty. You know, right. so you're transferring beauty. Uh, what we what since been discovered uh, is that beauty is a subjective thing. It's not. It's not. Uh, what your idea of beauty is not my idea of beauty. Right. Or and because it's subjective, and and what your idea of what's important or priority culturally is not necessarily mine. Mm -hmm. So because of this you know, art has to be more personal in its nature. And I think that when artists thrive, other people look at their work and then they say, wow, I agree with that. I, they, in a way there is, this enriches me in some way. And that's how artists sell paintings. Um, if it's an art director at a newspaper, in my case, they would look at my work and say, people need to hear from this guy. Right. <laughs> and then that's how, that's how I would get that job. Right. And on it goes. So it's it's a complicated thing, but it's definitely it's definitely something worth considering. Definitely. Yeah. You know. 
Yeah. Um, and then just to close it out here. Um, so our alumni make important contributions to their respective disciplines and many continue to play vital roles in, in, the, in the department where they serve as advisors and mentors to students and as potential employers. So in your time as a professor at St. John's University, what role have you seen alumni play in facilitating the success of St. John's um, art and design students? Well, that's a good question. Um, I've uh, came to know uh, some of the work that they did through the McCallum Society, mm -hmm. and we took over for um, uh, Professor Barbara, who had been doing it for a little while, and this was uh, probably about two years back. But uh, I think that they are supportive, and that uh, it's it's an aspect of St. John's. We're a little bit hidden in St. John's. St. John's is such a big university right. that this small department, um, sometimes because of size, I think, isn't really as highlighted. But we we do receive, I think, support, and I believe it's always appreciated and very well meant. And it actually helps students who are trying to find their way in in rather difficult. Because there's no there's no guaranteed future in the arts. You, you kind of find your way through um, having the skills when you enter into it, and then what happens out there engages you. So I, I thought when I was graduating, I might do children's books because yeah. I like storytelling, and I thought that would be ideal for me. I, I like the idea of working in my studio and developing stories for kids. Uh, you know, just because it would be kind of a nice sort of thing to do and many of the illustrators I admired did that right but um, I work quickly and I seem to have an eye for the political stuff so the newspapers instead found me yeah. and that's how it seems to work for everybody a uh, storyboard artist I know we've had students who have gone on to work at like Marvel Studios mm -hmm. uh, we've had students go on to work at magazines at, in uh, Nike uh, at Nickelodeon uh, they're all over the New York region, and they contribute greatly to, I guess, what you call our, our culture. Yeah. It's, it's actually surprising when you see how we've had a few alumni shows in the past, and when you see how diverse our alumni are and all the places they tend to be, it, it's actually very, very amazing. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't even realize that some have gone into package design. Some have gone into animation. Right. Like the Rausch brothers, they they won awards for their animation. Uh, it's just the fact that you had the privilege to teach them how to draw or help them along in some way is, is a terrific thing. And when um, alumni support this, they're supporting their culture. They're supporting uh, a point of view of uh, you know a direction that St. John's gives. And I don't believe it's like any other art school. I believe it it, it allows people to sort of be more introspective and allows the more individuality. And, and it also uh, doesn't issue, you know, any, um, you know, it doesn't block any, um, anything that might be not really promoted. Like say you wanted to pursue, you know, anything along the idea of religious art. Right. Uh, I mean, I know of some professors who actually pursue religious art. So, and it's kind of an, uh, a, a, uh, it's a, I think the one thing that's really terrific. And I think the environment is quite supportive, very supportive and very personal uh, because our department is small. We, we get to know everybody and we do support them. So, and alumni plays a role as well when, when they come out to shows. Uh, of course, this has been curtailed somewhat by uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. But when it, I believe, you know, COVID will end, it, it has to. It has to. At some point. Uh, if, it, if it is, it's the most tenacious disease ever. But I, I believe it will. And when it does, uh, the shows will recommence here at the campus. And I hope when there is an opening for uh, students who are going to be entering the marketplace, um, that alumni do come out again, as they have in the past and enjoy the work and maybe even find a piece that might look well on their wall, buy it from the student. You know, that kind of thing is very appreciated. Right. And also the contributions they've made to scholarship is deeply appreciated. So right. I don't know if that's, that covers it, but. Oh, it definitely know. does. 
it sounds like the okay. alumni play a, a very important role in, in the success of St. John's students. Oh, absolutely. It, it's essential. It's, it's, it's the hallmark of any great university, and I believe that the alumni here are solidly behind students incoming, and they're solidly behind the uh, professors and, and the colleges in, in a significant way. Right. You can't you can't underestimate it. And I think now more than ever with this crisis um, sort of looming overhead, because it has has impacted St. John significantly, right. that it, it will be it'll be an opportunity, I think, for them to stand up for St. John's again. Uh, they were here. They got an education, but it doesn't just end there. You know, this is their alma mater. It's their it's their old you know, they're home away from home, as it were. And uh, it's important to preserve, uh, I think. And the alumni are going to play a large role in that, I think. Definitely. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Kerr for sitting down with us today and finding the time to be our faculty focus for the week. I know I really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure our alumni will enjoy it as well.